Sibelius was born in 1865 and he died in 1957. While his music is very popular with audiences and academic circles, it's rarely discussed. Perhaps because he wrote symphonies and used third-based harmony, he's often considered a conservative composer, but this is a misconception. A closer look reveals Sibelius to be a composer who was anything but conventional. His style is very easily identifiable for even a few moments of his music. A composer's personal style usually evolves gradually over time as they first master the craft of composition and then discover the various aspects of their musical personality. For a composer to have an easily identifiable style means that they have strong preferences in harmony, texture, orchestration, and form. These things will occur often in their music and make it recognizable. Some of the individual preferences may be familiar from other music, but it's the combination that gives their music its distinctive personal face. Sibelius uses familiar techniques, but in very novel ways. For this to be effective requires that the composer understand the expressive potential of the technique in question at a very deep level. It's easy to be original with things that have no particular emotional impact. Finding the expressive potential in familiar things is much harder and much rarer. And this is what Sibelius does. Let's have a look at the first movement of Sibelius's fourth symphony to see some of these things in practice. This astonishing piece was written in 1911. The movement begins with a loud, forceful whole tone motive in muted low strings and bassoons. This beginning doesn't define any clear key, since the whole tone scale, having no semitones, is ambiguous by nature. Here it starts on C, but within a few bars it slowed down diminuendo and settled it to a pedal point, not C, however. Normally beginning a piece with a long, slowing diminuendo would lead to a disappointing sensation of lost momentum, but here the tonal and rhythmic instability create tension and suspense. Also, unlike the classical pedal point, this one is not a single note, but rather oscillates back and forth between E and F sharp. Now the musical essence of a pedal point consists of its stubborn insistence on one note, while the other parts create conflict with it. But Sibelius had discovered another possibility. By continually moving between two notes, there is a combination of obsessive focus and instability. To further obscure the tonal clarity, each bass note is always overlapped into the next one, so on every second beat, we hear both notes sounding together for an eighth note. This is clearly a harmonic decision Sibelius has made. There's no other reason for this unusual arrangement. After six bars, a solo cello emerges with a new motive above the moving pedal point. Although this motive is diatonic and not very dissonant, it's still hard to detect a clear tonic behind it. The G sharp might suggest that A is home, but the alternating E and F sharp in the bass keeps the matter open, and the line peaks a few bars later on a G natural. This phrase first repeats, and then is answered twice by a similar descending phrase, still over the constant E F sharp. The process then repeats, compressed. Now the answering phrase brings in the rest of the shallow section. Then, at rehearsal A, the cello solo and the section phrases start to overlap in imitation. This makes them longer and more intense. Next, the texture thickens, so that instead of single notes, each line is moving in parallel thirds. Before long, in the violas, these thirds rise higher to a new peak, D-flat, over a G-flat major chord. A timpani roll on G-flat reinforces the suspense here. The strings continue to fill out upwards into the violins, repeating the doubled third phrases, now in C major, but as always above the constantly moving pedal. 
Once all the strings have entered, the texture becomes homophonic, simpler. The melodic motive now turns into a rising scale, leading to a syncopated high G supported by a C major chord. This kind of textural simplification is a common way to prepare a climax. Just as the upper strings are about to reach their high G, however, the alternating pedal point is dislodged. The bass moves up to G and then down the scale to D. The brass also arrive here for the first time. The overall effect here is like a musical earthquake. The bass pauses on D under the brass chord, and then the alternation of the bass resumes, but now between C sharp and F sharp. The familiar melodic motive above has now disappeared. It's replaced by a new idea, a kind of a poggiatura chord, again harmonically very ambiguous. Then, at a climactic moment, the bass C-sharp moves down to the lower F-sharp, while the upper line of the violins rises dramatically, presenting the opening whole tone motive, but expanded in register. Then it outlines an F major chord, but very quickly in between a D-sharp and a G-sharp, and once again syncopated. Harmonic arrival here in the low strings on F sharp major is also far from unequivocal since the brass are holding an F major chord in the middle of the texture. The only resolved F sharp major in the last beat as the melody turns around the G sharp. And then abruptly it all falls away, leaving only the low F sharp by itself. So even here, no clear resolution. We've now had over two and a half minutes of music with no clear tonic. When I spoke of phrases, all were melodic. There has not been one single clear harmonic cadence so far. In fact, they are very rare anywhere in this movement. All the punctuation here is melodic, rhythmic, and or orchestral. In line with what I have called in previous lessons the coordination principle, the combination of ambiguous harmony, increasing dissonance, syncopated rhythms, overlapping phrases, and gradually rising register creates tremendous tension building up to a powerful climax, which, however, doesn't really resolve. Since I was unable to find a public domain recording of this symphony, please listen to one of the many versions on YouTube when the video is finished. The score is also available on MSLP. Of course, Sibelius wasn't the first composer to use tonal ambiguity, but the exact ways he explores it, that double pedal point, inserting the whole tone scale into an otherwise triadic context, the polychordal superposition of F major and F sharp major around the climax, all these things are very much his own. It's also worth noting that tonal ambiguity is often more intriguing to the listener than atonality, since it still creates expectations. So much of what we enjoy in music results from the many ways music can play with our expectations, whereas if the music just seems random, there are no expectations at all, and thus we sacrifice a very potent expressive tool. As a musical psychologist, Sibelius has achieved something extraordinary here. He's conservative only in the sense that he's appealing to the same psychological faculties that lie behind the music of the great masters before him. But I would argue that all great music must appeal to these faculties. Music that takes no account of what's audible or of how human memory and perception work is not likely to move the listener. This is only one example. There are many other wonderful things in Sibelius' other major works. Far from being conventional or conservative, Sibelius simply found his own expressive path and followed it through, producing very personal and moving music as a result.